Hello, everybody. We are very fortunate to have with us Kathy McGuinness, the State Auditor of Delaware, with us today. Welcome, uh, Kathy. Uh, Kathy is an important person in Delaware politics. She became the first female State Auditor in 2018. And before that, she was the City Commissioner of Rehoboth City. She ran a pharmacy in Delaware, and she also worked in the real estate business. So she has uh, exposure to many aspects of Delaware's public and uh, private life, the economic sphere, the political sphere. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted that she's here to speak with us. Uh, and also the subject matter that we will be discussing also relates to one of my classes that I'm teaching this semester at the University of Delaware called Good Governance. Before we talk about good governance, Kathy, can you just give us an update on the state of coronavirus pandemic in the state of Delaware? Well, um, I can tell you in regards to my world, I am constantly fielding calls up and down the state from everything from do I have to pay my rent or uh, will this bank accept uh, a loan? I I've gotten all kinds of calls on a daily uh, basis. And, uh, you know, statewide, I would commend Governor Carney for what he's doing. Uh, on the federal level, I wouldn't even get into that. Number one, I, I don't go negative, and we're only as good as the people we have surrounding us, provided we listen. Well, well thank you very much. And uh, before we start getting into specifics, uh, I think that uh, before you became the auditor of the state of Delaware in 2018, uh, we didn't know much about this, uh, that there is such a function. I actually went and read up, and I found that uh, we have a state auditor or state controller in every state. Mm -hmm. In 24 states, they are elected. In, in the other 24 states, there are all kinds, other 26 states, they have all other kinds of mechanisms by which they are appointed by the governor or the state senate, etc. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, what does the state auditor do? Well, uh, it's funny. You're right. Uh, nine out of ten people have no idea we have a state auditor, and the ones that do, the majority, uh, do not know what we do. They think I'm doing tax returns. Uh, <laughs> we are your, we are the state's fiscal watchdog. We're an independent elected agency, uh, one of six statewide elected officials, and we're the ones that make sure your hard-earned tax dollars are spent the way they were intended to be spent. That's what we do. We combat fraud, waste, and abuse. We have uh, the fraud hotline that, that we developed in nine months of my first term. So if you on your mobile device, fraud.delaware.gov. We do in all types of engagements, not just audits. We do in examinations, inspections, special projects, special reports, investigations, as I've said, financial audits, performance audits. So it's a whole host of things. And you're very much correct. Uh, my predecessor was in for 30 years. That's three, oh. three decades. My chief of staff is 30 years old. So the majority of Delawareans only know this office as how it was. And in my opinion, when I took over, it was in disarray. It was eroded. Uh, in nine months, I filled 20 positions. That's very hard in state government. And, and I come from the private sector. I've had two small businesses. I'm also a pharmacist, by the way, and I'm still a registered pharmacist. But I come from the, pro the, pu the public sector. I do have the nonprofit experience, been very involved. I've over-volunteered my whole life. I've, but I, I can tell you, this office, which I call my business, needed some resuscitation. So I went and read this section or chapter 29 that's uh, 29, chapter 29. yeah in the state of Delaware's constitution and that's where the authority and the definition and my mm -hmm. understanding is that it's not a job it's actually a state agency so you're Correct. like the head of an agency so you you could have your own secretariat and that's why these 20 employees right so you yes. have a function of tasks and the thing that stuck out to me was that you have the authority to literally subpoena all financial transactions that even the governor uh, and uh, the finance secretary or even any other secretary does make, right? And you're right. also mandated by the Constitution to actually do this twice a year at least, isn't that? So, so this is, we, let's get back to me taking over a dysfunctional eroded office, and I have 27 staff now. Um, in the first hundred days, I, I was, you know, racing around trying to get things in order, re, uh, look at these policies and procedures, internal controls. I had auditors who were spending 30% of their time not auditing, 
We didn't even have an HR person in this office, but we're supposed to follow the HR rules. So you can imagine the chaos and disarray. So 2019 for me was transformational. But as you and I both know, change is hard. Yeah. And Again, let me go back to my predecessor was in for 30 years. So everybody in state government is used to what is or is not happening in regards to this office. So here I come in, gangbusters, going, all right, we're going to do this, this. <laughs> I'm going to follow the code. We're going to do a Westlaw search. What should I be doing? My goodness, this is in Title 29, Chapter 29, and we have not been doing this for years. So there's some folks in there that we have not audited. So change is hard year was transformational to re-architect, redesign, do the first ever risk-based analysis audit plan for the state of Delaware. So many amazing things that have happened in that first year. So this year has become informational. Now, um, when we talk about accountability and transparency, that's very prevalent with, within our mission and efficiency and effectiveness in state government. This all applies to your monies. Um, Keep in mind, in June, I, I had commissioned an outside firm that had never done business with the state auditor's office before, so they could be very independent, and it said, come in, audit me, tell me how great I am, tell me how awful I am, Look, use the other states as benchmarks, put it all out there, and I had 58 findings and recommendations. This is, you audited the auditor? I had my office audited by an outside firm. Okay. It's listed at my website, so anyone in the public that's very transparent, can go to auditor.delaware.gov and look at those 58 findings. If I had not worked feverishly in the very beginning, before that June, and before they started looking into things and comparing and contrasting us with other states, you probably would have had 158 findings and recommendations. So my goal is to have that out to you in the next few weeks to say, I've addressed them, resolved, or fixed all of them. But I put it out there this is very hard for some folks who are not used to an active and engaged office here looking to be a resource and, and to work to further better government. I don't want to have that gotcha attitude that so many people associate and when they see me they go on the other side of the street because they don't want to see me. This office is, has been underutilized and undervalued and who loses? The taxpayers. You know one thing that I notice about the state of Delaware is Everything is about continuity, especially in, in politics. Uh, I'm not a major student of domestic politics or state politics, but I noticed that we seem to rely a lot on continuity. So if, there were, if the auditor for 30 years did nothing, we are used to that. Even though after reading up, I realized that uh, it is like a dereliction of duty not to audit uh, how we have been spending our money, especially where our constitution mandates that we have a balanced budget, right? So, Correct. so, so if the state is required to, it has such strict strictures on how it spends its money. It is very important that we regularly audit this. So, so my question to you is: Do you are getting? Are you getting a lot of pushback now for, from your fellow government agencies when you start asking them? Okay, I'm going to check up on your work. Some some have been um, reluctant uh, and hesitant, and some people have been pretty fantastic. I and and that's one of the reasons as well. Not only I wanted to really, truly put my heart and soul and passion into this office, um, and that's why I had it audited to show other people it's okay. Look, if you haven't been audited ever, or in five years, or in ten years, it's okay. It's okay to put it out there because we're going to move forward. We're going to look at where we are today and how we can move forward. So I used myself and my office as an example, and, I, and I, I, I made it out there for the public. I've had many people welcome me coming. It's smarter for me to go to an agency or, or those in, who, who make the decisions and go, how can I help? How can I be a resource? Direct me to where I can, can go and audit or do an engagement that better serves your staff or the public or office flow instead of me just going in going, oh yeah, I, I need to audit this agency, so let me think of something. The, the idea is about value to the taxpayer. And that's where, um, I, listen, a lot of these ideas are, are what I believe and what I feel, but it's been with a lot of research and speaking to other states, which I try to engage with another state auditor's office at least once a week. You know, I've been talking to a lot of state officials uh, in the last uh, few weeks, and one of the things that I've been trying to point out is that the the damage that coronavirus is going to do is not through death toll, but through economic fallout. It's not going to kill us, it's going to bankrupt us. 
and yeah. then poverty and underdevelopment and and all the things that are associated with bad economy is going to really hurt us. So uh, I feel that we are not doing enough right now, both at the federal or at the state level, to plan right. for an economic uh, resurgence, for an economic redevelopment uh, once we get over the, the, the coronavirus problem. Uh, but I think that would, would the auditor's office play a role in the planning process, not just in, okay, they made a plan, they want to spend $50 billion in making the state uh, great again, and then at the end of the year, you come and say, okay, let me see how you spend $50 billion. But do you also have a say in, wait a minute, uh, this is how we should be spending money uh, and not on how we spend. Do you, do you see what I mean? Do, do you get to say? I, I understand what you're saying. This is not uh, the first bailout, but this is the largest federal expenditure in U.S. Sure. history. So it's very important. And as we all know, history has told us, um, in times of pandemics or crisis, what happens to fraud? It goes up. Yep. It is incredible the schemes and scams that are happening already today. Yes. And, um, you know, it's, I believe, I don't know where that falls into, I would love to be a part, especially with our mission, especially with my my business background, um, to, to be a part of that. Uh, I've, I've actually suggested some sort of task force where we get the uh, appropriate parties together to collaborate in regards to this money coming in and, and kind of making sure you know, we're doing some oversight. Uh, I'm not sure how that will be received or if it will happen at all. And, you know, maybe it was a good suggestion, maybe not. But uh, I'm hopeful uh, because I can tell you, as you know, when I go and speak in front of folks before we had this this lockdown, and I'd, I'd love to do that around my work hours. Um, most people, you know, if they start zoning out, not listening to what I was saying, or maybe it just wasn't a topic they had to be, sure. they cared to be at when I would say, hey, don't listen to me. Don't don't listen to a word I say, unless you care how your tax dollars are spent. And we all end up finding that we do. We all find that we do when we care about the things we care about. One person might say, I love to go to the public library. Well, then you want to make sure there's funds there for the public library, you know, or I really care about this nonprofit. Well, then you want to make sure that we have the ability to grant them funds when they are needed. So so it's all intertwined. Uh, I just don't think people understood how important and relevant this office is. And that's okay. There's no blame. It is how it is. We're all different. I, You know, we all have different styles and levels of energy and endurance. You know, uh, we have an audit every month in our house when the credit card bill comes. So, you know, we hardly ever spend uh, cash money. We try to use credit cards as much as possible. At the end of the month, we actually know what we are spending on. So, you know, my wife can circle things she finds suspicious and I can underline things that I think we shouldn't be doing and then we know where the money is going, right? So, but, but what is interesting is that, is there a policy input for the auditor? That was where I'm going because it's not just about how money is made, it's about how decisions are made. Uh, like who is hired for important positions? Is there nepotism? Are you hiring your son-in-law to run everything from foreign policy to economic policy? Now, that to me would be something that an auditor should be able to audit and say, okay, this is not about money, but this is about rule of law, right? Rule of law, processes, internal controls, performance. You're right, but again, we've gone from seven auditors, seven auditors in one year to 20 in nine yeah. months, but half of my auditors are brand new and they're, they're auditor ones. So there is a learning curve. So we've had not only a huge adjustment for everybody to acknowledge and, and digest <laughs> that here is this office that's, that's working, um, and, and by the way, very inclusive and very diverse. Uh, we, we are multi-generational, and we make sure mm -hmm. that reflects in our team, multi-ethnic, was not like this before in this office because I believe you don't want the same people who've heard the same yeah. things growing up or the same experiences because that doesn't make for good strategic planning on individual engagements. But um, again, we get back to the point of, you know, we got in there the first year, we've reorganized, re reset, re-architect, redesigned this agency. Here we are, we, we've lifted up the hood, we've checked the engine, we're ready to run. Are ready to drive. 
when you were hiring people, did you hire people from Delaware or did you manage to get people who have worked with auditor's office in other states and may have some experience in actually auditing state uh, at, at the state level? Actually, we, we did have a few people who were already familiar and in state government at a high level in Delaware. Um, we also have, uh, it's just a, it's a, just a, a, a variety, a variety. We have the, the criteria that gets advertised um, and if people, it, this goes through HR, the division of HR. And so that whole entire process, they're the ones that send us the qualified applicants. And then you go through what, what has gone through the pipeline. You know, in my class, when we start talking about good governance, um, I, I try to tell my students that one of the reasons why the idea of good governance caught on so strongly was because institutions like the World Bank and IMF, which were giving loans to underdeveloped countries, were very worried about corruption and were very worried where this money was going. So the elite would basically rob their own country and then the population was stuck with huge loans with huge debts. So you, the third world debt crisis in 1980s, etc., was as a result of bad governance. So good governance essentially became a term for non-corruption, for transparency, uh, for, for essentially uh, a way of uh, uh, holding the decision makers accountable. So what kind of authority you have to hold uh, people accountable if they are not doing their job properly? Um, my authority is the, is the uh, citizens of Delaware, and that's who I answer to. They are the ones that some are starting to go, hmm, and pay attention after, they, after we have a discussion or a presentation. But uh, I reveal the information. We find the in information in an independent manner. We follow a certain criteria. We present it. You know I'm putting it out there in constant contact and, and on social sure. media, and I'm doing everything possible to let people know this is what's happening, and even developing the way we present that information. As you know, we have the one-page hot sheet, and you can click, click now onto the, the actual project. Um, but it's really up for people. This is, this is the duty of the Delawarean. They have the information coming out of my office. It's whether they want to hold... Uh, people accountable. Uh, we we do sometimes have recommendations from findings. So in the past, they did not follow up in this office. So who cares? Again, I can make some fantastic recommendations, uh, or we have findings, make recommendations, make it public. Sometimes that turns into a policy change, legislation or process change. But if nothing happens, if people aren't paying attention to what's going on here, then they can't hold their, their electeds in their areas accountable or at least say, hey, what do you think about this or how would you vote on that or something. Again, folks usually just pay attention to what concerns them. And I understand that. And that's why we change the way we deliver our message. However, we do not enforce. We just give the information. Okay, here's a tough and dangerous question for you. Oh, dear. <laughs> On a scale of 0 to 10, uh -huh. where do you put Delaware on transparency and accountability? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you, in 2019, uh, I set up my office, as I like to say, I got my home in order first. We actually track our own time. <laughs> so I know what, how much time are we spending here? How much time are we doing this? Is something clogging us up? And of course, I throw everything out there or we make it available to the public. And we have the, the hotline, right? So people have a place to go. We keep that anonymous. So accountability and transparency, my focus in 2019, has been on this agency that, that sorely needed it. Um, what I'm finding out, it varies. It, I cannot say because I haven't gotten to go everywhere I need to go yet. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you there are some places where I've gone I am very impressed. There are some agencies, and even if there were a couple slip-ups, they're really making an effort to change their processes or improve and be more efficient and more effective. And I've, it's, it's wonderful and it's refreshing. And there's been agencies who've been fantastic to work with and work together and say, okay, I ha one agency came to us out of the gate and said, we haven't had a contract with you for three years. We're supposed to be doing this jointly. And we had it done in a couple months. They were a delight to work with. And I just assumed it would be like that. Well, this is great. Everyone's you know so welcome and receptive. And it, that's not the case. Of course, 
uh, it would be really tough for me to, to judge when I haven't been everywhere. You have to gather all the information before you can make that decision responsibly. Well, I think to me it is itself a measure that for 30 years such an important office was more or less defunct, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of tells us as to where we were probably on issues of transparency and accountability. Let me ask you another way. When we look at, look at we are going through a presidential campaign, we have elections, uh, we have a senator who is contesting for elections in the state of Delaware, and of yeah. course uh, the, the entire Congress will be elected in November. Uh, touch wood, hopefully everything goes fine. But in our debates and our discussions, we have extremely intense uh, conversations about imaginary plans. You know, I will do this, I will do that, I will do that. But very little discussions on the issue of good governance, like, you know, that the, the ability to govern is quite a difference from being popular or liked. Exactly. Uh, and I agree. I agree. And, and you know, to lead is is tough. Leading this office, I think, you know, even though I have that nonprofit and that uh, public and governmental background, which now it seems it's all come together those past 25 years of of doing. That. I mean, I was elected almost almost 20 years in Sussex County. So so all of that coming together now. Trans, but but the business. I'm telling you, having the two businesses. Knowing what speed you have to go and be able to change lanes and shift gears quickly and be able to survive and also being able to think ahead of time and prepare. You know, I, we have these continuation of operation plans, the COOP plans. I, had, I started saying what was going on here in February. I said, we, we got to get our team together and prepare ours and update it. And again, we're updating it again like last week. But we were already on top of that. Uh, I already started telling folks before there was the opportunity to telecommute or suggest it, start bringing your laptop home and your, and your charger, just in case. We never know. So there was always that preparedness. But, but, but to be able to do the things that we need to do I think you need to have those backgrounds and experiences. It's great to say, I'm going to promise you this and I'm going to promise you that, but can you execute a plan? Can you give me a deliverable? That's, these are the things that matter to people. They, and, and honestly, I had a really tough time when people said, would you do this or would you do that when I was running? I said, I'm not good with promises because I, I do, I, I, it sounds like, oh, I'm going to promise you the world, uh, so vote for me. I said, you know what, I'll promise you hard work and an open mind. That's what I know I can deliver. You know, I've been asking this question to nearly everybody. Uh, like, do you have a personal philosophy of governance? Like, like, of, like, if you were to be made governor, what would be the values and norms that would guide your governance? Um, I, I have a, what I would say is I've always followed um, accountability, transparency, efficiency, effectiveness. Um, I always believe in service. I'm just wired that way. And, uh, you know, you lose yourself in serving others. And that, to me, if, if that's your true passion and you're authentic, it'll end up showing. And that hard work over the years, um, people start realizing that person's legitimate. <laughs> They're for real. They're really actually going to do what they said. And then you build that trust with that community or that, uh, that entity or group of people. I, I, I think there's so much that goes into good governance. I think that's kind of a word, like an umbrella, and there's so many things that, that hang from it. But they all, have to be, they all have to be authentic. They all have to show value and meaning, but they all have to be executed and to be able to execute a plan that takes a certain personality and that takes um, endurance. If, if I were to audit uh, the federal government's response to coronavirus, mm. you know, I, I would like to, for example, find out uh, how good the intel was and how quickly, when did the president know, what did the president know, and then did they take responsible decisions in the public interest right away. And also sure. this tiny, it seems like a tiny but critical task of appropriating PPE and other vital technology, uh, such as ventilators, etc., acquiring these technology, is the state, is the government doing everything that it can potentially do, like the delay in using the Defense Production Act, I think, in my opinion, should be prosecuted for criminal offense. They're putting a population at risk. Uh, so would you audit uh, the government of Delaware after this and try to see if they did what was absolutely necessary to do 
in the right time in, as a response. I mean, is the Delaware state preparing? We expect a spike in the next two weeks. Governor Carney was saying that in the mid of April is when we probably will see the, the spike. Already we have reached, I think, 14 deaths and about 500 cases. So, so would you plan to, I think, establish a commission or something like that to see if the state of Delaware responded as it should have responded so that in the future we are better prepared because I think these pandemics are going to become recurrent. They're going to be so, more and more and more and more frequently. So, and that's a good question because my thought was the task force uh, and my suggestion more along the fraud, the corruption, the, the fraud, waste and abuse that's already starting to happen. I'm not going to say in Delaware, but it's happening around us. Um, and, and it, you know, making sure there's accountability of these millions and millions of dollars that are coming our way. Uh, again, I have to commend Governor Carney. Uh, he has been uh, taking some uh, stricter uh, restrictions than some other states. Oh, yeah. And, and I appreciate that. And uh, again, uh, I, I, you cannot, you, it's tough to judge something like this uh, when it's, when you're talking about life or death and the information that goes to you in a, in, in a, and how you're going to make that decision. We're only as good as the team around us. And I think he's doing a pretty darn good job. I don't like to go negative. So on a federal level, I don't know what kind of information someone was getting. I'm sure they're getting loads of Intel from loads of different arenas and entities. Again, you have to listen to the people that are around you and and make those good decisions with what you know and what you're qualified to to judge and lead so mm -hmm. on a federal level i just can't even go there but i can say right now from from what i gather it it, it is, appears to me uh um it's my understanding that we are prepared and sure. i know things are happening and they're probably not i know they're not happening on everybody's favorite timeline because i get calls day oh, and goodness. night and yeah. I'm, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to listen and I am here to help and direct people. I don't have all the answers, but I can certainly look up a phone number or maybe navigate a state website a little quicker than someone who's never been on that website. So, so that's our job, right? We're helping in every way that we can. So, uh, you know, so far, so good. I, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic and I, again, have to commend the team and Division of Public Health and everybody, they're getting information out. I'm sharing that information to my groups and other people are sharing that as well. So uh, if we wanna go back and look, if we have intel that this is gonna be something that's reoccurring, absolutely we wanna, we wanna be able to improve. If, well, if, the, the intel was good enough for some people to sell their stocks so <laughs> very early right? on. Right? <laughs> of course, some people, right? <laughs> my, uh, my students are mostly uh, political science students and uh, okay. and since this is a 400 level class several of them will be graduating in May and I think this is such a such a terrible time for students to to graduate last month they thought that the economy was doing so well unemployment was low they, their prospects were so good and now we are looking uh, probably at an economy which might be in an extremely terrible position we are shrinking by some estimates, by maybe even 25% in second quarter. So we, we could be in a recession, if not in a depression by the end of the year. So the students are all very much afraid of, of, of the future. And even ceremonial things such as their graduation is now going to be virtual or delayed. Uh, right. so, so two things. One, I would like you to give them some message about how life is in the political sphere, you know, like being an elected okay. office. Is it an attractive thing to do or should you do something else? And the other is, uh, is there a message of hope for students who are graduating this year? Absolutely. Um, you know, I have a, a senior in high school and a senior in college and a junior in college. And those two are going to be missing their graduation, my senior in high school, no prom and no senior week and et cetera, et cetera. And I said, you'll always remember this. And then I had a daughter that turned 21 who thought she was going to be doing something different on her 21st birthday instead of hanging out in the driveway with us and a card table and some appetizers. <laughs> so I went, sorry, well, maybe next year. Uh, I absolutely there's hope we're just pivoting so the people who are quick on their feet and the people who know how to change and shift gears uh, absolutely if you're interested in political science and you want to serve we want I want the people who want to serve because they want to serve not because they're looking 
uh, to hold a position or a title. I mean, big deal with that. There's somebody who really has value. And I think maybe right now in these crises, as they say, it brings out the best in us. And we're coming together and we're doing things and rediscovering things that maybe we've been overlooking for a long time, especially on the family and community front. Now is a great time to get involved. It's a wonderful time. It's inspiring. Whenever there's something bad, you can find something good out of it. And I want your students to take away that message that there is good government governance in gover government here in Delaware and their auditor's office that's um, probably a little unconventional and very different from other state agencies. We're working hard and we're trying to do the good work of the people for the people. I think you have a great opportunity to reinvent this office. And, uh, yes. Uh, so so I, I want to thank you for spending so much time uh, and being so candid with me and I also wish you all the best and please stay safe. I know you're very busy and very active, so take all the necessary precautions. Absolutely. And, I'm uh, over I'm overreacting. I like to overstudy for that A like all those students in your class. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.